Albert Einstein once said, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. And the research I'm conducting involves just that, both the scientific and the sacred, ancient wisdom and modern science, which is at the heart of the reemergence of government-approved psychedelic research in America today. I'm thrilled to be giving this talk in Marin County, California, sort of... <laughs> It's sort of like in baseball parlance, a home field advantage. <laughs> For the past 10 years, my colleagues and I at NYU have been investigating psilocybin, the psychoactive compound in many species of mushrooms, you know them as magic mushrooms, to explore its therapeutic implications in relieving human suffering, cultivating existential well-being, and enhancing our understanding of meaning-making and spirituality. Psilocybin mushrooms have been used for millennia by indigenous cultures for insight and healing. An important distinction is to separate the cultural frenzy of the 1960s from the important scientific contributions made with these meaning-making medicines, which is what they potentially are, meaning-making medicines. Unknown to many people is that from the 1950s through the early 70s, there was a large body of scientific literature documenting their promising clinical benefits. At the heart of the world religions lies a mystic core, what the wonderful Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy, an experience described by mystics and countless others throughout human history. And it appears we're wired for these meaning-making experiences. And again, it's remarkable we can do this in a safe research setting with these medicines. And while it involves the drug psilocybin, it's not about the drug per se. It's about the experience, this mystical or peak experience only one dose can generate, and for so many people has profound and sustained clinical benefits. One important implication is for people with cancer and people who are at the end of life who are suffering emotional distress. I want to share with you some words spoken by people in our cancer anxiety study who entered the study because they have cancer or they were dying and they had severe anxiety. Some of these people have since passed away. This changed my life. I felt this constant state of becoming. I felt gratitude like I never felt before in my entire life. Death doesn't matter. From a person dying of cancer. I'm less afraid of death. Death is part of life. Something else I experienced was the feeling that one is eternal and that all of existence happens in every moment. And everything is love. So what is this mystical experience we're talking about? The primary features are unity, a strong sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things that people experience in these states of consciousness. The noetic quality, a profound sense that one is encountering ultimate reality or knowledge. Sacredness, feelings of awe, humility, holiness, wonder. Deeply felt positive mood, joy, peace, and love. To overwhelming degrees, people often are, are crying during these experiences Ineffability, the experience seems to be beyond description, impossible to describe. And what I think is likely one of the most important features is this feeling of transcendence, transcending time and space, and this experience of transcending past, present, and future, this consensus reality we share. It's an incredible experience. Clinical research shows transcendence and meaning-making are the two primary features in helping end-of-life distress. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote, healing is the personal experience of the transcendence of suffering. And for people in the cancer study, after taking the psilocybin pill, often they would pull the lens back, so to speak, on their experience. They view themselves, their life, their suffering from a much broader perspective in a much larger panoramic field. This timeless dimension can force the non-attachment 
to suffering and cultivate a connection to something more enduring within us or to consciousness outside ourselves. For a person who is dying and whose body is failing, the insight that we're not only these bodies, I am not this cancer, is truly a gift. And they report deep feelings of gratitude, compassion, and equanimity, and appreciation for being alive in this very moment, the one they have. Albert Einstein again said the most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. We don't die well in America. Dying has become medicalized in hospitals behind closed doors and needs to be humanized. And while the end of life can be profoundly difficult, it can also trigger a search for meaning and an opening towards the sacred. Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor, wrote, meaning can be found in life literally up to the last moment, up to the last breath in the face of death. Last year, our group at NYU, along with a team at Johns Hopkins, following research from UCLA, published findings never seen before in the history of psychiatry. Dramatic reductions in anxiety and depression and other forms of distress in people with cancer and at the end of life after a single dose of psilocybin. This is the living room, like I said, and the sessions took place in. This is actually a day of a session before the person arrived. After getting settled and taking the pill, we give them some assurance if they need so, and we encourage them to focus inward, to turn inward on their interior. And we give guidelines, the most important being trust. Trust the guides you're working with, and most importantly, trust your own innate wisdom. Trust consciousness. Let go into the unfolding changes in experience, and welcome all the feelings that arise, no matter what they are. By moving directly into experience, even suffering, and we've seen people move directly into the fear of death. And we've seen those moments be transformed into teachable moments and insightful ones. They've also reported amazing insights about life, death, and the very nature of self. A single dose of psilocybin produced sustained, immediate, significant reductions in anxiety and depression seen here by the pink bar, which is the psilocybin bluest placebo, one day after the session, 80% of the participants show these benefits at the six-month marker. Demoralization and hopelessness, two awful experiences linked with end-of-life suffering, really leading to the suffering in so many ways, was dramatically reduced in the weeks following the one psilocybin session, again, the pink bar being the psilocybin versus placebo. 70% of these patients reported this experience as the top five most, including single most, meaningful, significant experience of their lifetime. Nearly 90% reported improvements in general well-being and life satisfaction. And so many people spoke about love, which was quite remarkable. I want to read to you a few quotes from some people and their experiences. The first is from a woman named Dinah, who's a wonderful woman, whose cancer was actually in remission when she had her medicine session. But she was frozen with fear of recurrence and really couldn't function. Now, I love this quote because Dinah was, uh, is a self-described atheist. She's from Brooklyn. So a Brooklyn atheist is not like a Marin County atheist. <laughs> a Marin County atheist says, well, something exists. There's some energy pattern, there's, some, there's something going on. <laughs> and the Brooklyn IT says, no, there's nothing going on. <laughs> just have a seat, relax, have a drink, just... <laughs> this is it. And so Dinah wrote about her experience. After a while, I began to feel love, just all-encompassing love, and I felt that I was bathed in love. And the only way to express this in our language is to say, you were bathed in God's love. Well, I'm an atheist, so bathed in God's love is not what I want to say, but that really expresses the feeling, totally encompassed by love. And I can still experience that frequently. It's been a few years now since her session, and she's doing wonderfully. 
The second quote is from a man named Patrick, who I had the privilege to work with. He passed away about a year after the study was over in his 50s, a very young man. He had a very, very tough cancer. He had an incredible experience that day on the couch with the psilocybin, and it changed how he died. When he died a year later, he had meaning and dignity and acceptance and had no fear of dying that both him and his wife, Lisa, both attributed to this experience. Patrick wrote about that day on the couch after taking the psilocybin. From here on, love was the only consideration. Everything that happened, anything and everything that was seen or heard, centered on love. It was and is the only purpose. It was so pure, the sheer joy was indescribable. And in fact, there are no words to accurately capture my experience, my state, or this place. I know I found an earthly pleasure to ever come close to this feeling. And Patrick had a wonderful and full life. No sensation, no image of beauty, nothing during my time on earth has felt, has felt as glorious and pure and joyful as the height of this journey. I took a tour of my lungs. So Patrick had tumors, metastases in his lungs at this point. And part of his journey within was exploring his lungs, he said. He wrote, there were nodules there, but they seemed rather unimportant. I was being informed to not worry about the cancer. It's minor in the scheme of things. The real work to be done is before you, love. My life has changed in ways I may never fully understand. But I now have an understanding and awareness that goes beyond intellect. That my life, that every life, all that is the universe equals one thing, love. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote, our true nature is the nature of no birth and no death. Only when we touch our true nature can we transcend the fear of non-being, the fear of annihilation. We're currently on track to pursue further research with cancer patients or at the end of life. And while this research is preliminary and further research required to verify safety and efficacy, there are profound implications, including to improve how we die. Peace, dignity, meaning are possible even with the imminent separation from this incredible life we all have. Treatments for addiction, depression, and post-traumatic stress. Pro-social and ethical implications. Implications for interreligious dialogue. It provides a method to scientifically study the neurobiology of consciousness. What is consciousness? Where is consciousness? Are we worried for meaning? And if so, why? What happens to consciousness upon physical death? What, if anything, is enduring? Many people in our study say it's love that endures. On the day of Patrick's session, he came in after some weeks of prepping him, getting to know him. Nine o'clock, took the psilocybin capsule and lay down. For two hours, didn't say a word. And then at 11 o'clock on the dot, he said, birth and death is a lot of work. Birth and death is a lot of work. He later told us that evening when the experience was over, that that was the start of his journey within that shaped and changed his death into an incredible passing. I had the privilege to meet with Patrick about a week before he passed away. And while saying goodbye for what I knew was the last time, I was pretty emotional. I'll never forget, he stood up with an incredible grin and assured me everything would be okay. <laughs> Patrick and the others in these studies have been teachers, showing us what is truly possible. Our true potential. Their lives, and in some cases their death, were changed with these medicines and with these experiences. And in the process, they changed us. It's been so moving to witness these experiences and to see what our true potential could be. How we could relieve suffering through experiences that we seem wired for. We seem wired for these meaning-making, transcendent experiences happening throughout history, occurring naturally, 
and reliably being generated with these medicines. And they've confirmed for me that what we call in palliative care a good death is indeed possible. And that perhaps the very ground of being or the nature of consciousness is what they and the mystics describe as love or some kind of great awakening. And that indeed we are all connected. And maybe that's our true nature. And it's available to us all. When he spoke those words of birth and death, it reminded me of a Zen saying that I want to close with tonight. Let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes by and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. Do not squander your life. Thank you for listening.